Welcome to part two of my Optimizing Hydration for Athletes series. Now in part one, I talked about how basic recommendations like drink half your body weight in ounces per water, or go to the internet and find a hydration calculator to figure out how much water you need to drink. Those systems are okay, but they're far from being ideal. We can do a lot better, I guess is the point, right? So more specifically, we talked about all these things you see in white in the first video. So if you missed that one, go ahead and hop back now. I would strongly encourage you to do that before you watch this video. But if you're a good little boy or girl and you've already watched video one and you're here for video two, this is what we're gonna get into. So I'm gonna talk more specifically about how hydration works physiologically and biochemically, how that all happens in your body and why certain things are actually needed. We'll talk about how to identify how much you sweat, whether you're a high sweater, low sweater, moderate, and what's actually in your sweat, high salt, low salt content. How do you figure that out? And then what does that mean, right? In other words, why do we, should we not just be telling everyone to drink the same things before, during, or after their workouts, right? It needs to be individualized. We'll talk about sports drinks and electrolyte packs. More specifically, I'll go through a bunch of them and I'll show you what's in each one and how they differ and then which one you should choose based on what you found out about how your own personal sweat rate and content works. And then finally, and perhaps most importantly, we will enter and discuss our final two of my criminally underrated MCs. I hit one to three in the first part of the video, and now I'll hit the last two in this discussion. Right, if I had to actually summarize all of video one, I'd say we covered the first part of this sentence. How much water to drink, how many fluids to drink, and how that differs based on your body type training, how hard you're working, and all the things that go into answering part one, how much. But we never discuss what. That's the, import, that's the entire point of video two. So we know the answer is clearly not that, right? You don't wanna just drink water. Again, not that it's necessarily bad, but it's not optimal. That's the whole point. We wanna maximize our performance or get as close to that as we can. So the basic thing we have to consider here is this. You aren't sweating out water. Though when you look on your skin and when you see it on your shirt, you're like, oh my gosh, that's water. No, it's sweat. And so you can't just drink back water. You need to drink back sweat. In order to figure out then what we need to do, we have to have a nice, lengthy, in-depth, complicated discussion about what is in sweat, how our body works, how hydration works physiologically, and then what to do about that. So that's what we're gonna get into in the next section here. If you're sort of dozing off or you're not fully engaged right now, I would get up, go chug a gallon of water, maybe go run a sprint two or three miles. I don't know, do something, but you gotta come back when you're focused and ready to go. I know I'm ready to go right now. I'm raring, are you? If you're not, get the hell out of here and come back when you are. All right, you here? Okay, let's party. Humans have on average about two and a half million sweat glands throughout their entire body. And for some reason, they're actually highly concentrated in your feet. There's, estimates are in the range of about 250,000 of them just in your little feetsy there, which is one of the reasons why some of you got stank ass feet. In fact, actually, you know what, some totally off topic here, but my two-year-old, Tatiana, she, she loves, I created, I showed her this funny little joke where every time she takes her socks and shoes off, she'll take them and put them up to her nose and be like, ew, pee, you, stinky. And then she actually like, acts like she's eating them, you know, she'll be like, oh, I'm eating my socks, yucky. It's, it's hilarious. So she's two and has already figured out that feet stank. All right, and that's probably why, too many sweat glands down there. But physiologically, how the whole process works. I talked about in part one, the human body is somewhere between 50 and 70%, mostly between 50 and 60% total water. The rest is solids. And if we break down that water content, we put it into three big categories. And in fact, I'll actually make those three into two big categories. Right? So category one is what we call the ICF or intracellular fluid. Category two is the ECF or extracellular. Now intracellular is exactly what it sounds like. It's the fluids that are inside of your cells. So of all the water in your body, about two thirds of it or 66% uh, is inside your cells. That's the vast majority of, of where we hold it. The remaining two thirds or the remaining third rather is in the extracellular fluid. And the ECF is comprised of two things, interstitial and plasma. Interstitial is basically the space in between all your cells. And about 80% of that third is in the interstitial space. So translation of all the water in your body, the vast majority of it is in your cells. A lot less is in between your cells, and then some of it's in your blood, but that's a very small percentage. Okay, so from here on out, I'll refer to those as ICF and ECF, 
or I'll potentially say interstitial and plasma. But those are your three major distinctions. With that in mind then, when we're talking about maximizing hydration, we know that our, the biggest emphasis needs to be getting fluids into the cells. Okay, losing some interstitial fluid is probably survivable. And we don't want to lose plasma fluid either, but the real driver here, again, 66% has got to go into the tissue itself. If we then do things like just chug straight water and we greatly expand our plasma fluid, we may have solved the problem there, but unless we got that water to go into the tissue, we haven't really solved the bigger problem. So how sweat works specifically? Let's get into some detail. Okay, now, as I mentioned, we have our ICF right here, and then on the outside, what you're seeing, this black line is important because that represents the cell membrane or the outside of the cell, the thing that stops it from being the interstitial fluid, okay? Outside of that, like I said, you've got your plasma and the interstitial space in between. Take the interstitial and the plasma, combine them together, and we've got your ECF. Now, outside of your plasma, actually, and more specifically the capillaries, is where your fat and skin layer happens. Your sweat glands are, of course, then embedded in your fat and skin. They go all the way down and make some kind of contact with the plasma. And that's how you take things, put them in the blood, get them into the sweat glands, and then get them out of your actual body. That's the basic process. Of all the things that are inside each one of these categories, it's very important we understand what is in where and in what rough concentrations. You don't have to know the exact amount, but you have to know how it is relative to the other compartment. For example, if we take our first electrolyte, chloride, first and foremost, you see it has a little dash there, which means it has a negative charge, and that's going to be very important later. But we see actually there's a lot of chloride, more of it in the interstitial space, and then some of it in plasma. So if you're going to look at a basic concept of gradients and osmosis, if this membrane was wide open, right, if there was no blocking here, then some of that chloride would want to go inside of the cell so that it would balance it out. Instead of being three and one, it'd be two and two. This is how hydration works at the most basic concept, right? We have to balance osmosis and diffusion with a couple of other things that we'll get into. Our next thing that's of importance is potassium, right? K plus. And about 98% of the potassium in our body is actually in our cells. So it's a huge concentration there with a little bit of it being out in the interstitial space and, um, of course, some little amount is in the plasma as well. We also have our third most important, or th our third important component here, which is Na or that sodium. Of course, there's a little bit of sodium inside the cell, but the vast majority of it is actually in the ECF and plasma. Now, all of you that have had exercise physiology class, you're like, oh yes, action potential, electrochemical gradient, all that stuff. Yes, but you may not realize how important that stuff is in hydration. Okay, so this is basically what we're looking at. Now we also realize that we've got, and I'm calling it glucose here, but you know that when we store carbohydrates in, a, in cells, it's not glucose, we store it in the form of glycogen, okay? But just to keep things a little simpler, I'm calling it glucose. We also know that you've got some amount of glucose in your blood. Remember, baseline here, I'm gonna show you why this is important in a second. Okay, so if you were to kind of highlight this in the top, you can see there that the intracellular is basically a whole bunch of potassium with a little bit of chloride and a tiny bit of sodium. In the plasma, equal, almost equal parts sodium and chloride and a lot less potassium. Now, sweating is basically when you start taking the H2O or the water from the plasma, you put it into these sweat glands and you begin to move it from there through that little channel out and it starts to beat up outside. You continue to do that and the sweat, the water pulls up on the outside. But importantly, it's not only water. Granted, it's a high percentage of water. So if you were to look inside that droplet, you would see that it is about 99% H2O. But it's about 1% sodium, chloride, potassium, magnesium, and calcium. And you can see what I'm depicting there. The vast majority of the electrolytes in your water are sodium a little bit less chloride, and then a whole lot less potassium, a whole lot less magnesium, and then trace in very small amounts of calcium. So if we're to think about this in the context of hydration now, we know that we need to drink things that are in large part water, right? This is mostly what we're losing, but we need a lot of sodium, a lot of chloride, maybe a little bit of potassium, and then potentially some magnesium, and I guess maybe you could consider calcium, but it's not really important because that number is really, really, really small. So coming back to our image here, what we're really looking at is this. Our sweat is actually, oh, look at that. 
What do you notice about our sweat, the contents of it, and the contents of the plasma? Hmm, interesting, right? As I said at the beginning, you're sweating out sweat, not water. So you don't want to drink back water, you want to drink back sweat. Which, now that you know the contents of the sweat, you know that it needs to be in large part sodium and chloride, and a little bit of potassium, like I said, maybe some magnesium. Well, you're probably jumping the gun a little bit here, so I'll spill the beans, but if you were to take a sodium molecule, combine it with a chloride molecule, we would call that new molecule sodium chloride. Street name, salt. So if you were to just simply take some water, add a couple of pinches of salt to it, you would actually get a lot closer than just drinking it. Now, we tend to call these combinations of ions like sodium, potassium, chloride that have charges on them like pluses and minuses. We call these the electrolytes. That's all electrolytes are. Basically, sodium, chloride, potassium, right, and then maybe even some magnesium. These are the primary players. So really, your sweat process doesn't look like what I represented. It actually looks more like a combination of that, right? Where some of those ions would be in concentration in the thing that's sweated out, and that's what's actually going to be on your skin. And this is why if you've ever had a dog and, and you sweat a little bit and you go over your dog, you're, it loves to come over and lick the sweat off because it's a bunch of salt water and, and animals like that. Uh, also why you can put salt licks out for cows and deer and things like that, and they run up to it because they know how important it is to get that salt in. Okay, so like I said, lots of water and lots of sodium and chloride are lost from the ECF with sweat. So, oh, enter the problem here. We used to look like this. Okay, now we look like this. And so in order to optimize hydration, if we're not careful, we've dropped our sodium content a lot from the, the interstitial fluid, which is supposed to be very concentrated. So now it's actually very similar to the concentration in the cell, the ICF. When we lose that gradient, sodium doesn't, no longer wants to rush inside the cell. Potassium no longer wants to rush outside the cell. And that's problematic because that's what we have to have to cause muscle contraction. Now, I guess in the most extreme, if this was the cardiac tissue and not the muscle you're probably thinking of, and cardiac being also muscle, just a different kind, if there's no electrical chemical gradient there, we no longer have a concentration gradient, we no longer have contraction, your heart stops beating. So I guess in, you know, two, in fact, I don't even plan to go into this, but uh, you all remember Dr. Kevorkian, right? Dr. Death, the guy that was one of the most famous physicians uh, for helping physician-assisted suicides. He would basically give people a giant bolus, uh, an IV, basically, of potassium. He would hook it up to them, right? And he would say, all right, whenever you're ready, just turn it on. He would get huge dumps of potassium here. The concentration of potassium on the outside of the cell and the inside of the cell became equal. And so these sodium and potassium things didn't want to exchange, so even when the channels were open, they didn't move anywhere. No gradient, no muscle contraction, and you slowly sort of drift off to sleep, and your heart stops beating. Right? That got kind of morbid. Interesting, though, right? Okay, well, anyways, kind of back to here. The same thing you can imagine happening now with either a high, extreme increase in concentration of potassium or a decrease in concentration of sodium. And now, if you go back to video one, I talked about, yeah, people become dehydrated, but another mistake folks make, even during exercise and competition, is overhydrating. So imagine that you didn't even necessarily lose the sodium, or you lost some of it, but then you, you drank back way too much water. You get what we call hyponatremia, which is low natremia Na. Low sodium concentrations that are caused not, not usually by losing too much sodium, but drinking way too much pure water. So the concentration here becomes extremely dilute. It doesn't have any difference between here and here in sodium, so nothing happens, and then the muscle stops contracting. And this is why, again, almost every year we see somebody in a triathlon or a marathon or some endurance event like that actually die from drinking too much water during the event. Right? They lose that concentration gradient. Things get too diluted on the outside, and we have a problem. Right, so, if we want to maximize our hydration status, we need to make sure that we're drinking back something that we call isoosmotic. So something that is the same, it, it, kind of like concentration, it's not the same, but we'll just call it that for now. Something that is the same concentration as what we lost, that's in the ECF. If we do that, then we can expand the total volume here, 
and we can continue to do that and we won't have any problems with concentrations. If we only drink back something that is too dilute or something too concentrated, something too salty, then we're going to have problems. So I'm going to walk you through the physiology behind each one of those scenarios. Okay, let's start right here. Now, here's what happened. Remember, this was our starting state here. Okay, actually going back to there. Everything was nice and happy here. We started to sweat. We know we started to lose a ton of water. So the total volume of the area, your plasma, as well as interstitial space, goes down. We, we've lost water, right? Water is what gives it its space. We started to lose water and we started to lose some of the gradients. So look what happens to the total volume. Boom. There, right? Not the volume of the, of the fat and skin, but the plasma and the interstitial space go down. Okay, so we've lost content and we've lost total volume. No good. Well, because we've lost so much water, we lost more water than we lost electrolytes, we lost volume and we increased concentration. So now the outside of our cells, the ECF, is concentrated and low volume. Now, when you think about osmosis and diffusion, right, and you know the basic principles, I'm not going to walk you through them, what would then happen? What would the cell membrane do given that it is permissible to water? Well, things are going to want to go from here to there. Well, things more specifically being water. When you do that, the volume of the ECF returns or increases. The concentration goes down because you're putting more water in it. But now the volume of the ICF goes down and the concentration goes up. And however much water you've lost from here will determine how much you move from the ICF. Right? So a little bit of loss? Okay, fine. Basically, the ECF or ICF says, okay, we'll cover you. We'll go down a little bit in our volume. Well, we can afford increasing our concentration a touch until we reach equilibrium. You continue to do that though, you're gonna to continue to lose water from the cell. And this is how your cells become dehydrated even though you're sweating from your plasma, right? And as I mentioned, given the fact that most of our water is supposed to be in our cells, if you continue to do that, you can see how the cells will lose their contractile function very quickly. You're gonna lose performance when muscles can contract. Whatever it is, power, strength, speed, accuracy, right? And we talked about all these things actually in the, in the first video. Endurance, I mean, you name it, it's going to go down when you start losing volume and increasing concentration in the UCF, right? So water is going to want to go that direction until it reaches something like that. Okay, so we've now got low volume and high concentration in both the ICF and ECF. So to summarize all that, the results of sweating are this. Both inside and outside of the cell are low volume, meaning water, and high concentration, meaning too much sodium, potassium, and chloride. So if you want to put some more specific numbers to this, this is what we're looking at. What's in one liter of sweat? And remember, one liter is 2.2 pounds, all right? 1,000 milliliters is the same thing. Okay, this is probably what we're looking at. On average, people range somewhere between 500 and 2,000 milligrams. 2,000 milligrams would also be 2 grams um, of potassium and about a fourth of that in, or sodium, of sodium and about a fourth of that in potassium. Now, a, probably a very fair way to think about this is it's a generally a 4 to 1 salt sodium to potassium ratio. Therefore, what you put back in should be somewhat close to that ratio. So as we get in, you know, down the talk a little bit and we start looking at different hydration products, we're going to want to make sure that we're close to these ratios. Now, having said that, look at a couple of things on there. Uh, I know that, for example, Major League Baseball teams, oftentimes in preseason, they will hire a company. Uh, there are several of them, but th these companies will come out and it will do a, put a little patch on your arm and it will measure not only your sweat rate, but the sweat content. And they'll figure out, are you closer to that 500 milligram potassium or of sodium? Or are you closer to that 1,000 or 2,000? Um, now, if you're, say, in the 1,000 milligrams or, or 1 gram per liter of your sweat, that's what we would call kind of a moderate number. Uh, 1,500 would be a little bit higher. 2,000 would be, would be pretty high. I'm not sure I've seen many folks that high. And 5,000 would be pretty low. So I guess if you wanted, if you're like, oh, I don't know, I have no way to test it, um, and I'll talk about things you can buy later, probably starting off that either between 1,000 or 1,500 would be the assumption, okay? And then just divide that by four, and that's probably where you're at for your potassium. Chloride actually tends to mimic sodium pretty well, as we talked about, for several reasons, right? Uh, stoichiometry of 
of salt is one sodium, one chloride. Your sweat is actually pretty similar. So whatever you have in uh, sodium, you can assume that it's probably similar in chloride as well. Sometimes it's a little bit higher, but you know, again, if you get them measured specifically, then you'll know. That's either way. In terms of magnesium and calcium, they are often super negligible. I mean, you're talking a tenth or a twentieth of the amount of magnesium as you're probably going to sweat in sodium chloride. So really, we're talking about the big three, sodium chloride and potassium. Having said that, um, it is pretty common for folks to be low in magnesium. So it's not the worst thing ever to add some magnesium to your hydration thing. It's not probably a huge component of your sweat. But if you're going to add a bunch of electrolytes and you're going to drink something specifically, this is a good chance, I guess, to add some magnesium to your diet. So not the worst thing ever. All right, so to walk you through this, this case study, I guess, here, let's say this individual athlete was doing a hard track workout and he lost four and a half pounds in a one-hour track workout. Okay, that would be how many liters? Two, right? Roughly two liters. Uh, four and a half pounds per hour is a very normal, kind of upward end, but not, not, not that crazy. Um, for a 165, 70-pound athlete to lose four and a half pounds in a, outside, okay? Not, not incredibly difficult. So I didn't pick an extreme example. In fact, I, I would call this a somewhat normal, maybe slightly higher than normal, but nothing crazy workout. His absolute numbers would probably look like something like this. It's somewhere between one to four grams, and I know I switched units on you for the sodium, but I'm, part of what I'm trying to do with these videos, honestly, is teach units, so don't tell my students that, right? But anyways... 1,000 milligrams, one gram, you get it by now, okay? Uh, you would see how many, how much potassium there as well as the chloride uh, and magnesium, okay? So then this is a specific amount. Uh, we would say, okay, you lost this much weight. We know that there's this much concentration there. Therefore, this is exactly how much of these electrolytes we need to put back in your body. Now, if you drink water straight, you're going to get the H2O part, but you're not getting any of the sodium chloride or potassium. So again, I mean... Uh, like, I don't want you to think, oh my gosh, if I drink water after my workout, I'm gonna, I might die. That's probably extremely unlikely. However, you're not optimizing the situation, okay? So we can do better than that. I've talked about this a little bit, but let me show you specifically what this concept of hyponatremia really is. So if you can imagine coming back into here, okay? Now, we talked about when you sweat, how we reduce that total volume of the ECF. Well, if you drink back too much water, you do the opposite, right? So now our volume gets extreme and our concentration goes down, okay? So again, a common mistake, hyponatremia is not usually because of low salt intake, and it's not because of excess salt loss. It's almost always a function of excess pure water intake, okay? Don't get tripped or tricked on a quiz question about that. Okay, too dilute is the issue. No gradient there, therefore we have problems, okay? If you do that, in theory, the water should start to go back into the cell, okay? Osmosis, the same thing would happen when we went the other direction, right? So it should be flooding back in there. But that actually doesn't happen, okay? What? Yeah, it doesn't work that way. Some folks would think, oh my gosh, I want to get a maximum high volume in my ECF. Then that will push water back into the ICF, rehydrating it, and everything would balance out. But that's not how it works. Because of a little thing we have to talk about called the RAAS, right, or the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. Okay, now this is actually pretty complicated, so I'm going to give you the super condensed version. Basically it is. You have these things in your body, this stuff in your body called aldosterone, and that effectively helps you hold on to sodium. On the opposite end of that, you've got a thing called the antidiuretic hormone, ADH, and that tells you to hold water. Okay, so now this is something we manipulate in weight cut scenarios with our combat sport athletes, right? So we can do what's called water loading, we can manipulate the aldosterone and ADH systems, and then they will just sit around and basically start peeing and peeing and peeing, and their weight will come down. And the reason we can do that is because the point, or one of the major points of ADH and aldosterone, is to monitor and regulate fluid and sodium. So when you start messing with both of those, you start messing with the amount, the activity, and the sensitivity of aldosterone and ADH, and you get a pretty particular uh, physiological response, which is just this. Okay, so if you start to become hyperhydrated, or again, whether you're water loading because of sport, or you're, say, drinking way too much water, 
um, that's to dilute, and we have that expansion. You have excess fluids, right? So as a result of that, you see a decrease in ADH and aldosterone. The result of that is a decrease in sodium and water. Retention, right? In other words, diuresis. So your body says, whoa, way too much fluid. Let's reduce how much sodium and water we're holding on to because we know sodium also helps you hold on to water. Okay, so too low sodium diet, you're going to pee things out because you're too concentrated. Too high, you're going to hold water, right? So during our rehydration process, we want a lot of sodium to help us keep our water in. But if, again, you just drink way too much water, those hormones go down, sodium, your body gets a signal that says, hey, stop. First of all, get rid of the water. We've got too much. And then second, start getting rid of sodium because we're holding on to too much water as it is. And we know that that will further the situation. So physiologically, you start dumping those two things. An increase in, uh, by the way, for the record, an increase in potassium also has the same diuretic effect, okay? So this is another way that you can sort of cheat the system. If you're super water loaded or something, just bump up the potassium and that's gonna help you pee more, right? Sodium makes you hold on to water, potassium does the opposite, right? So this, again, like I mentioned, this is exactly how water loading works, all right? So if we go back to our figure here, we know that post-exercise, somewhere between 25 to 50% of the water you drink will be lost in urine. So let's say you go back to that original thing and you lost four and a half pounds of fluid. Well, if you drink four and a half pounds of water straight back, you then are gonna pee off 25 to 50% of that to two and a half pounds. Your actually net result is you only drink back half the water that you lost, which means you're still dehydrated. And this happens, again, because we drink too much water too fast. We get a great expansion of the ECF, high volume, low dilution. The body thinks, hey, we got excess water here because it came in so fast. Now let's urinate it. So before we had time to put the water back into the cell, we actually start peeing it out. So here we are sitting there dehydrated in our cells, too much water in our plasma, and you start peeing it out rather than moving it into the cell because you drank too much, too fast, and it was too dilute. All right. This also has a problem for a number of other reasons. Number one, it gives you a false sense of hydration. Why? Because you chug a bunch of water, five minutes later, you go pee, and it's crystal clear. And you're like, yep, I'm hydrated. Nope, you overdrink water. You drank it too quickly. Also, since you've smashed so much water, it cuts down the amount of saliva signal you get, and the thirst sensation goes down. So you're, it, your body, own body tells you, we're good here, bro. Don't drink any more water. So you stop feeling like you need to drink water, despite the fact you're actually peeing out half what you just drank and your total hydration status is not recovered. So you're really fighting yourself. And hopefully I'm kind of guiding you toward a solution. I've been hinting at it, how you solve that problem. Okay? So again, we talked about in the first video, when we look at athletes, we see that they typically under rehydrate by about 50%. So if you lose a liter in exercise, most athletes, if you just don't do anything, will only drink back half a liter. Almost identical to the amount that we're getting there, right? So you combine that with the fact that I'm not drinking enough pure water, I'm not drinking enough fluids as it is supposed to work out, and half that's being lost. Well, the net result is you only get to about a 25 or so percent rehydration. Not a good thing, right? So the fluid must be at the same concentration as the ICF, or if it's too dilute, right? Like I said, we're gonna pee that out. If it's too concentrated, we can see the opposite. So you can pull water out of the cell, actually, if it's too concentrated. So you imagine the outside being small, super concentrated, will actually continue to drive more fluid out of the cell to change the concentration uh, in the ECF, right? So you could further the problem. In addition, you can give yourself diarrhea. So, so when you ingest something that is really, really concentrated, super salty, that salt gets to your intestines before it gets all the way out of your gut, right? So some of that gets in there, and now you actually made your intestines incredibly concentrated, which means it's gonna pull water into your intestines and your digestive tract. Well, you know what happens when you get fluid in your digestive tract? You get explosive diarrhea. I don't know, I guess you didn't have to be explosive, but diarrhea nonetheless, right? So again, you're dehydrated, and now you're going to get diarrhea, diarrhea, which exacerbates the dehydration even more. <laughs> so you have to know what you're doing. In fact, I could tell you a number of professional athletes in weight cut and weight class sports who get diarrhea almost every time 
they go through the rehydration process because they don't know what they're doing. Okay, so you really want to make sure the concentration is dialed here, right? You can see problems on both sides. All right. Oh, what's that? You see a number four on the screen, which could only mean one thing. My fourth in my list of five criminally underrated MCs, and this one is a bit of a cheat because I actually have two people on here. And I picked them because I figured it's a bit unfair. People know them, but I think at this point in my life, it kind of breaks my heart because they're more known for their acting than they actually are their, MC their MCing, which sucks because they're actually super legitimate MCs. So I wanted to make sure that you all knew out there Fresh Prince, Will Smith, Ice-T, yeah, you know them, they're like Hollywood actors, maybe they're, no, they are both incredibly legitimate. In fact, every damn time I listen to an Ice-T song, I'm like, man, he's so underrated. The guy is so good. Go back and look up his history a little bit, but, but he started a whole revolution, a whole style of rapping that is still going on today. In fact, it's the predominant style of rapping no one really gives him credit for doing it. People don't realize what he actually started. They give other people credit for it. But if you get in the know and those people who get credit say, no, no, it was Ice-T. Ice is the one that did it. Still active today, occasionally. And then Fresh Prince. Like, go back and listen to his first couple albums. Uh, flawless. Just flawless. If the guy never acted in his life, he still would, would have been an all-time great MC. Just incredibly talented. Uh, he, he's, yeah, it, it's just insane how good that dude is. Um, so many, so many classic songs. Once we get into like the, like Will Smith, like 2000 era, we start to fade. But when he was with Jazzy Jeff, who's another legendary dude, um, those first, like I said, two or three albums are just, just, just incredible. Um, there's a lot of MCs out there right now that Will Smith would smash. No question, right? All right, anyways, back to our, our list. So like I said, our sweat replacement fluid should contain what is in our cells specifically, these four items and at ideally a similar concentration or osmolality. So if we go back to here, how much of each goes into it? Remember the example I gave you was our athlete lost four and a half pounds, we'll call it two liters. That was the concentration and everything. Well, we also forgot to add our glucose, okay? So we need to add back those numbers plus a little bit of sugar in the same amount that we lost. And here's what that means. Like I've been saying, this is actually sodium periodic table, it's Na. And I've circled a little thing over here, which is a fun little trick that you probably don't care about, but I think is really cool. So we know that the molecular weight of sodium is, we'll call it 23, okay? Well, if I know I've lost and I've sweat out 1,000 milligrams of sodium per liter, right? Let's just say you were to have an average sodium concentration rate. Well, can I just go out and put sodium in my water, I guess? Well, no, you can't. It's very, you can't put things in your body that aren't neutralized. So you rarely can get something that is a positive or a negative charge. They almost always have to be made into a salt. Right? So that, the salt basically happens when you take a positive and a negative, combine them together, it neutralizes the charge, and that's how we have to deliver it. That's why whenever you take um, you know, magnesium or calcium, or all these things, they have to be actually in a different form because they have to be neutralized. So again, our problem is we know we have to bring sodium back into the body, but we can't do straight up Na. So how do we get that back in? Of course, our answer is aha, our friend chloride. Turns out it's nice in the fact that we also lose almost equal pounds, parts chloride. And we know a specific molecule or combination, I guess, that is one part sodium, one part chloride. Now, here's where the math gets a little bit funny. Since the salt is those two things, uh, but chloride actually has a molecular weight that's almost twice sodium, so it's something like 43 or something like that. The total weight between the two is a little bit different. It's almost a two-to-one combination, right? So in other words, if you need like, say, 500 milligrams uh, of sodium, you actually have to give them about 1.5 grams of salt to make the math work, right? You follow me there? Well, let me walk you through it, okay? So we have about two and a half times the milligrams of sodium to equal the amount of salt we need. That's the easy way to do it, right? So if you need, again, a thousand milligrams of sodium to replace because you, that's your sweat rate, we need to have about two and a half times the milligrams of sodium that you need in salt, which in this case would be about 2.5 grams. Okay, 
So the translation of all that would go, okay, you are estimating you're a moderate salt sweater, uh, which mean would be a, a gram per liter. You need to then put back about 2.5 grams of salt because of that two to one molecular weight ratio. You know that salt is gonna, although it's one part each, right? That 3.5 uh, molecular weight of the chloride is gonna mean that it's heavier weighted, more biased towards the chloride. So you need to come up to two and a half grams or so in salt to get your one gram of sodium. Does that make sense? I know that wasn't the smoothest delivery I've ever had, but I hope after repeating it six times, you started to kind of get there. All right, again, if the molecular stuff, weight stuff just threw you for a whack, just go back to the, the equation here on the board, okay? I didn't mean to make things more complicated than it had to be. Usually I do, I, think, I feel like I do a pretty good job of doing the opposite, but I, I may have lost you there. Okay, now, I've mentioned this a couple of times, and you may be thinking to yourself, well, how do I, I know if I'm a heavy salt sweater? Outside of actually going and get it physically tested, one thing you can do is just simply look at your outfit. Look at your clothes. If you finish a workout, and I actually recommend people wearing a hat uh, the first time if they want to try this, give it a day or so or whatever. When the thing tries, look at the color. If you see white all over the place, or you see no white, or you see just like covered in white, that's basically going to tell you how much salt is in your content, right? So a a white person that's got white all over your gear all the time, you would assume you're probably more like that 1500 milligram folks, high salt sweater. If there's nothing ever, if it's just wet and then it's dry and there's nothing on it at all, then you may be close to the 100 or the 1000 milligram or maybe even the 500 milligram. And you could play it from there, right? So maybe give yourself two and a half grams uh, of salt in that, if that, you know, based on the equation here, maybe go down to two, maybe try three. In the day, it's pretty close. Um, so it's not that big a deal. Oh, for the record, you don't think about salt in terms of grams. If you take a half a teaspoon of salt, that's going to be about two and a half grams of salt. And you know that then therefore is going to be about one gram of sodium. So if you think you're a thousand milligram per liter person, you do it. So you did a workout. You weighed yourself. At the beginning of the workout to the end of the workout, you lost 2.2 pounds. You think you're a medium salter. Therefore, you, need to, you know you need to replace half a teaspoon of salt in your water. All right, so I just took you down from chemistry all the way through practical application of how much salt to put in your water, and it wasn't that complicated. Again, if you're a higher person, double that, you may have to go up. You may have to go to three quarters of a teaspoon uh, or a full teaspoon if you think you're a real high salt sweater. Don't make the mistake, though, of teaspoon versus tablespoon. You're going to poop yourself all over the place. It's not going to feel good. Right, and since we're here, I'm not gonna leave you hanging. Three teaspoons is one tablespoon, like I said. So if you're trying to shoot for one teaspoon and you actually get one tablespoon, you actually got six. Yeah, so you, 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 you done messed up, right? That ain't gonna feel good. And since we're here, one tablespoon equals about 15 grams of salt or about six grams of sodium, all right? So again, you shot for five grams of salt because you wanted one teaspoon. You actually picked up a tablespoon and you got 15. Oops, triple the amount, no good. A lot of the times I will talk about this in terms of a pinch of salt. And so you may be wondering yourself like, well, how much is that? In fact, I think I said earlier, I'll just put a pinch of salt in your liter. Um, that's somewhere usually in the neighborhood of two to 400 milligrams of salt, okay? So if, if you go back to our equation here and you're saying, okay, I know I need two and a half grams of salt and each pinch is say 400, in order to get that, you would have to five exit, something like that, right? So five pinches of salt somewhere. A lot of times during weight cut week, like I'll tell them, hey, uh, three pinches of salt in this meal, three pinches in this one, two in this one, one, right? And we can go from there. And my assumption is there's somewhere in the neighborhood of, of that 500 milligrams at the high end. Uh, of salt per the bench. Now, another benefit of adding salt to your fluid is that it enhances thirst desire. So water, as I mentioned, water actually does the opposite. So it's kind of counterintuitive, but when you drink water, you want to drink less water. When you add salt, you want to drink more. And so remember, people don't drink enough, only about half as much on their own volition. And one of the keys we talked about, the four things in the previous video, one of them was adding more salt so that you can trick them into drinking more water. And this is exactly why. Okay, so let's move on to potassium. 
You can sort of think of this as the opposite of sodium. It rapidly moves into the cell, right, because of the concentration, so it helps drive water into the ICF, which is really, really good, right? So it's something we want to have part of our equation. I, naturally, uh, sweet potatoes are a, a very common uh, source recommendation. Everyone thinks of banana, but don't forget the sweet potatoes. Uh, coconut water, as you'll see in a little bit, is an extremely high concentration of potassium, and even avocados. And these are probably the four main places people get potassium in their diet, with the exception of our last one, spinach. That's right, actually. So remember the whole Popeye thing where he has the spinach and his muscles get larger? Well, that's actually true, right? Because there's a high concentration of potassium in the spinach. So when that comes in, like I said, read the bottom, rapidly moves into the cell and drives water into the ICF. Intracellular fluid goes up and you get a pump in the muscle. Right? We also know, of course, the role of sodium and potassium, and specifically potassium, in muscle contraction. So there you go. Somehow in the 1940s or whatever the heck this was, these cartoonists kind of nailed it. Right? It's pretty dope, right? Okay, so the last piece then is carbohydrate, all right? So I mentioned this, and we said we gotta come back to it. So here's what we know. Increasing glucose in the plasma means you increase your insulin, right? So you go and have a giant bowl of coconut water, and well, that's a terrible example. Just a, something with a lot of sugar in it. Okay, you pick your example. I'm not gonna do all the work for you, okay? You gotta do a little something. We know that insulin goes way up, and the point of insulin is to drive glucose back into the cell. So we can take advantage of this when it comes to rehydration. So we know that glucose also takes water with it into the cell. Ah, that's right. So glucose itself has to go through a transporter called GLUT4, but as a part of that, it brings water with it. So not only do we need to probably replace the carbohydrate that we lost in our muscle if we've come about dehydration from exercise, but we also know that we can trick, we can enhance the, the water transfer function by bringing glucose into the, into the equation, which will pull water in. You then metabolize the glucose for whatever reason and leaves water in the cell. So small amounts of protein can also help um, in gut disturbances here. So one of the things that I do different than a lot of folks post extreme dehydration and think weight cut stuff, right? is pretty close after they get off the scale, although you don't need the protein, I actually like to give it to them because uh, I feel it helps a lot with gut disturbances. So they'll come off the scale, they're gonna drink these super hydration cocktails they mostly need water, sodium, potassium, right, salt and chloride, and carbohydrate for store. But I put this stuff in there, I, again, for a bunch of reasons, and this has been shown, it's not just me making it up. It helps with them not getting as much bubble guts, right? They feel a lot better, more settled. Okay, also with carbohydrates, just like salt, people tend to like to drink more. So this is one of our two, the, the second of our four keys to help people drink more water during or after exercise. It better taste good. You add salt and sugar to something, people are going to drink a lot more. Just water, maybe they drink 500 milliliters. Salty sugar thing, maybe 700 milliliters. And boom, you solved one of your problems, which is they just don't simply drink enough fluids. So that's another reason to get it. So the general recommendation we want is something between a 5 to 9% concentration of mostly glucose with some fructose. Okay, now, if you go higher than that concentration, it becomes difficult to get it out of the stomach. Okay, you're also probably going to get some gut cramping and some bubbly guts. So it's really, really difficult, on the, especially if you're coming off of a long, a decent amount with low carbohydrates or, or none. So higher than that actually reduces the, what we call gastric emptying, so the amount of the rate that you can get things out. Lower than that is it's not enough carbohydrate. And so it's this magical kind of number that's been shown to be hey, somewhere in the range of 5 to 9%. You want mostly glucose because that gets out of your stomach pretty quickly and it goes directly into your cells and this is exactly what we're talking about. But you want some fructose as well. And that's because it works through a different transporter in your stomach. And so you can actually enhance the rate of getting carbohydrate out if you're using both transporters maximally rather than trying to just jam more things through one. Okay, so this is why you're gonna see most well thought through hydration products are gonna have a combination of glucose, mostly glucose, and some fructose as well. Of course, you can get this through food, and we'll talk about that when we get to the end. All right, so if we come back to our, our picture here, um, if they are a high sweater, which a lot of the athletes do, you will actually start to see some magnesium loss. So like I said, even though magnesium loss is a small amount, if the total amount of sweat starts to become really, really, really high, 
well then that small amount of magnesium is actually starts to become a significant number. And a lot of athletes are low in it as it is. So I don't see, actually I think some, there's some intelligence behind putting some magnesium in there. Right? Well, we already talked about these ones, right? I told you that if you just add your salts, you've got your sodium and chloride concentrations taken care of both in amount and equalness, right? So one part each, you got to take care of that. So what I want to do now is cover many of the common sports drains and electrolyte solutions, and we'll see how they start to stack up. We're going to pay attention to their sodium, potassium, chloride concentrations, as well as whether or not they have magnesium and glucose. So let's take a look at our chart here. And first, I want you to think about our example. Remember, we're working off this case scenario where we had a 165 or so pound athlete. He lost two liters of fluid. We knew his sweat rate. And so here are the absolute amount of each of the electrolytes that he lost, okay? And we can start looking at these things. Now, I've, I've put these in terms of per two liters, which would be 64 ounces, which is crazy, right? But that's the amount he lost. So I wanted you to see directly, for example, look at the numbers, the amount of sodium in that much power age. Look at how much he lost. At minimum, he probably lost a gram or a thousand milligrams. Are you gonna get enough of that in Powerade? Not even close. In fact, more likely he probably lost somewhere between two to three, maybe even upwards of four grams, which would be 4,000 milligrams. We're nowhere near that concentration in Powerade. Look at our potassium, right? 200 to 1,000, we're on the low end of the spectrum. No magnesium whatsoever, and probably a good amount of carbohydrates. So, we're probably fine with the carbohydrate load, but our classic Gatorades and Powerades aren't gonna hit the mark. And so this is one of the things that we'll laugh at pretty consistently when we see people that are using these products for hydration. They're not terrible. It's better than pure water, of course. It's pretty close, right? They just don't have enough. It's kind of counterintuitive. A lot of people think, oh, they're too salty or they have too much sugar. Well, they actually don't. They don't have enough sodium. They have very, very, very little potassium and they have no magnesium. They also have the carbohydrates in a form usually of high fructose corn syrup, which is not properly glucose and fructose combinations. So the sugar amount is okay, but it's not an ideal type. Sodium amount is okay, but it's too low. Potassium is all right, and then no magnesium. Well, we, we compare that to the, the more common, like optimal hydration thing that people love to use, Pedialyte. Okay, sodium concentration is getting a lot better, and look at potassium. Hey, pretty good there, right? We've probably nailed it a little bit. But maybe even a little bit too high though, right? But it's okay, better than that than, than the lack of Gatorade. We still run into the problem though of, of no magnesium and I would argue a little bit low uh, amount of carbohydrate as well as the wrong type. Okay, so a lot of folks will then take Pedialyte as like a base and then start combining it with other things like a better carbohydrate source um, or something with magnesium or some additional water to kind of hit your combination. All right. So in general, if you look across the research and all and a bunch of different sports drink products, I just highlighted three here, not to pick on them, but they usually only have somewhere between 10 to 25 percent of the needed sodium. So they're not going to cut it. In theory, you could take your Gatorade, sprinkle it with a little bit of salt, and that would help a lot. Um, but we could probably do better than that. All right. If we go to the next things, now these would be more sort of natural hydration solutions uh, that people like, coconut water being one of the more popular ones, and what you may not realize is milk. Now, I know you're thinking to yourself like, there is no way I'm gonna come off of a soccer field and drink some milk, <laughs> I get it. Um, think of these as probably like post-exercise hydration solutions or pre, rather than ones you would drink in a game. Okay, but let's take a look at it. Let's go with coconut water. Like I said, it has a mega concentration of potassium, so you're gonna rock the socks off of potassium. You're gonna be good there, right? Maybe too much though, if left on its own, right? Because we talked about, remember potassium helps you pee too. So perhaps not optimal. Too low salt, no magnesium, and actually a good, and a good form, right? Because you're gonna get that fructose, so it's a good form of carbohydrate. So we kind of nail it there but we don't have a thing. So one solution would be to take your coconut water, add some salt to it, and then dilute it down a little bit. So add a lot of salt, add a little back, maybe even add additional more carbohydrate to it, and you're in a pretty good spot, right? Now, if you were to just take some straight coconut water, you'd be okay, especially if you added some salt to it. All right, but there we are. Well, if we look at milk, actually, it's pretty damn good. And in fact, more recent studies in the last year or two have shown that it, it, it pretty much rocks the socks off of hydration. We always knew it was good for things like muscle recovery, but hydration is really quite impressive the way that it works. 
it still to me is low on salt. Um, it has a lot of potassium. And now take a look at it. Boom, we're starting to crush that magnesium source, right? Uh, the type of carbohydrate is perfect. We're talking disat, well, it's not perfect. It's very, very, very good, right? It has sucrose in there, which is glucose and fructose, has some other stuff. So it's, it's in a really good spot. All right, so honestly, if you're like, I only want to drink natural things, um, this, this is probably your best bet. The last category I want to cover are the hydration packs. So these things don't really work in terms of, you don't buy them as RTDs or ready to drinks. So you buy them as packets and add water to them. So what I did is I gave you these in their serving packets. You would have to mix multiple of these up to get to that area, okay? Uh, but it depends on the size you get because they come in small, big ones. Or So it's a per concentration. But let's take a look at them, okay? Like I said here, uh, amounts per packet or tablet, usually per 16 ounces. This is usually how you can figure out the amount, okay? If you wanted to make 64 ounces, though, you just say take four noon packs or whatever you're going to do there. So it's, it's easy to scale up. In fact, I'll sort of jump the gun here a little bit. But this is one of the reasons why I like these products a lot more than these products for hydration. Because one, I can specifically and fairly easily control the concentration and amount. Okay, I can't do that. I can't dilute these things anymore here. All I can do is kind of start adding salt. It also has no processing, has nothing else in them. Um, and... I can combine them. I can make combinations. So I can take a cerolite and add that to coconut water. Ooh, I can take a drip drop and put that in with um, some Pedialyte or something like that, right? Or just more water, whatever. So it gives you a lot more flexibility, uh, which helps you individualize and personalize your approach. So if we start taking a look at each one of these hydration packs individually, um, we you see different pros and cons. So there may be different ones that you pick for different athletes. For example, um, you may be in a situation where you want um, some of these things, but um, you want no or very little carbohydrate. Okay, and there could be situations like that. In that case, you might go with the noon pack, right? You know, it's very low in concentration. It's basically all salt. You can see that between these three ones, um, they make, you know, they're, they're pretty equivalent in terms of their amount of sodium and potassium. Noon and drip drop have a little bit of magnesium, and you can see cerolite and drip drop have a little more carbohydrate. Uh, Cerolite specifically is a very good con uh, carbohydrate source. It's a rice-based thing. It digests extremely well and very, very quick. It actually, um, it, it will give you no cramping whatsoever. I, I promise you. It'll go right out. It won't even go to the large intestines. It'll get out right through uh, the first part of your digestion. And it works very, very, very well. Um, new uh, Cerolite also makes a, this is called the 70 because that's the, the osmolality of the salt concentration, but they make higher ones as well. Um, I don't believe drip drop nor noon um, allow you to do that, but Cerolite has different kind of combinations, bigger packs, smaller packs that if you need a lot of it, not just in size, but again in concentration. And then of course there's a, a new one on the market just in the last year called Element. Um, and you can see that, actually I like it a lot. So to me, this is, I don't have any affiliation with them whatsoever, um, but to me, I think they've, they've got the system a little bit better. They've got the concentrations right. Uh, a lot more sodium in them to the equivalent. You see actually they have a five to one potassium to sodium ratio, so it's a little bit high, but hey, that's totally fine. A lot better than these ones that are more like two to one. In addition, they've got a lot of magnesium in them. The downside is they have no carbohydrate. Okay, so when I use Element and I've used it in the past, um, I always add a carbohydrate source for the sake of hydration. Now, I don't think they made their product specifically for hydration. Um, like post year, I, th I think they made it for sort of like daily hydration. So in that case, they didn't want to add sugar to it. I'm sure all these companies have different rationale for why they made their products the way they are. I don't ever like to think about things as being bad or good. I just want to know what's in them, how they work, and now I can use them to my advantage, right? So I have used all of these products numerous times with great success, okay? I will look at the individual I'm working with, figure out what do they like personally? What do they know, what have they used in the past? What do they have access to? Um, what do their teammates like? All these things, right? And then I'll say, okay, great, you like Pedialyte. Okay, great, well, I know Pedialyte's got here and here and here, but the downside is this. So, hey, can we take a Pedialyte and can we add um, maybe some noon to it? Oh, great, yeah, why? Because it's easily to mix in there and be a little more salt, we would, we would be in a fine position there, we would dilute it a little bit with some water. Hey, in fact, maybe we would add some coconut water to it. 
right? Potassium would get really high up there, or maybe we add something else. Maybe we take some honey and drizzle it in there and get some more carbohydrate. So there's lots of ways you can go about it. Um, this is, I, I know it's kind of frustrating because when people watch these videos, they're like, tell me the thing. Add this amount of this, this, this. And I hate doing that because I don't ever do that personally. I never have like a system I can, people, oh, buy Andy's weight cut and rehydration thing, and I don't do that. I always say, what do you have? What do you like? Boom. Okay, well, we have this and this is there. Let's add more of this. Oh, that tasted terrible. Or I tried the noon and it, man, I didn't like it at all. My stomach. Okay, great. Let's try cellulite. Oh, wait. Boom. Everyone responds differently to these things. So you have to try different combinations and then adjust according to what you have. Sometimes it's just salt water. Sometimes it's just salt in, in coconut water. I mean, there's lots of ways we can go about it. So learn the concepts, learn the science, and then memorize this chart. Print it out. Keep it with you. I don't care. Put it in your back pocket as a note card. Walk around with it, you know, so you know what to do with your athletes. And you use it however you want. I'm, for that record, tell me I'm wrong. Come back and tell me, yeah, you've tried this before and it didn't work, or this one's right. Uh, I'm open to all these things, right? I'm just trying to help you along your path. Okay, so now coming back to our original thing. Like I mentioned at the beginning, um, I don't want you to guess here. I want you to assess. So let me show you how you can actually do that. First and foremost, it comes trial and error. Every single time I've worked with an athlete on weight cut stuff, rehydration, they, I always tell them, I, I can't guarantee it's going to be perfect the first time. But I'll make, I'll probably guarantee you it's going to start to get real, real, real good by times two, three, and four. Because everyone's system works a little bit differently. So we have to figure that out a little bit. So step number one is trial and assess. So pick a combination, weigh yourself pre and post, figure out how much you lost, and then try something here. Then try other ones. Try it a lot on yourself, try it on your athletes, and try different things. That's going to give you by far your most accurate information. Okay, that's finally part two. All right, so for those of you that missed part one of our series, we talked about how much water to drink throughout the day. Part two was how much to drink during your workout. And now part three will finally hit replenishing your fluids post-workout. Now, in order to do that, I just got done saying don't guess, let's assess. Here's what you do, and I've sort of alluded to this already. In video one, I talked about these, all these units here and how these, some of these you can use in your own home uh, or if you're more scientific or have a bigger budget, you can go to that. But you can combine all these with a simple weight test. So just take yourself, totally naked, and get on a scale. Put your clothes back on. Don't forget this part. Then go do your workout. Take all your clothes back off. Dry your hair if you have a lot of hair, whatever it happens to be, and then weigh yourself again. Make sure you wipe the water off, right? If you started at 170 pounds and now you're 166.6 pounds, then you know you've lost 3.4 pounds, right? Yes, 3.4 pounds. Then you know your sweat rate, right? How, well, sorry, time the amount of workout, right? Was it 45 minutes, hour 25, divided by whatever or, or multiplied by whatever time domain you used? And now you figure out your hour sweat rate, rate, rate per hour. Don't forget, though, to account for the amount of fluid you drank during the exercise. So if you lost 3.4 pounds but you drank one pound of water, 16 ounces during the workout, you actually lost 4.4 pounds because you've already brought a water a, a pound back. Okay, so factor that, factor, that in, factor that in your equation, it's easy math, and then you're good. So now you've got a better indication both directly of how much you're losing. You can know more specifically your hydration status in the morning and everything else, right? But in this case, we're talking about pre and post workout. And then if you can scrounge up one of these hydration tests and you can get a patch on yourself and figure out what's the concentration of, of the electrolytes in your sweat, then you start to have a real good damn idea of how to optimize your hydration, okay? Now, and of course, in our laboratory, we always use something like this, right? So we would have them do this test, go to their workout, and do that afterwards. But if you only have access to the scale, that's pretty darn good too, honestly, okay? And then you can deploy what we call the Little John what? system okay you can see the article here if you want to read more about it called am i drinking enough yes no or maybe um this is by bob kennefit Ken bob is just a, a legend in hydration um, a super sweet guy really really nice and has just done a ton of stuff in this work so he and his colleague uh, at the army came up with this um and nate came up with this system called the wut right now this is in combination i believe with gatorade uh, but it basically said this w for weight u for urine and tea for thirst. And so every day in the morning, you check your weight, you do the urine thing I talked about in video one, as well as the thirst. You could also do this pre and post exercise. And here's what it's basically going to tell you. Imagine a Venn diagram. Okay, if you had two of these things show up, 
then you're likely dehydrated. So for example, um, you've lost a significant amount of weight and you are, uh, your urine is not optimally covered, but you're not necessarily, you don't feel like, you know, like thirst hasn't gone down. You're still probably likely. If you only have one of these three, you may or may not be dehydrated. Two or more chances go up, right? So the same could be combination. Urine looks great, but your weight uh, has gone down and you're thirsty. Or this third combination, which is urine's colored, thirst is up, but weight's fine. All three of those combinations of twos probably mean you're likely dehydrated. If you have all three, it's extremely likely that you're dehydrated. Okay, so our post-exercise fluids should be in summary here around 125 to 150% of the fluid that was actually lost. So if you've lost four pounds, you need to drink back six or so, five to six pounds back in, okay? Now, a lot of people like 125% better. I think it's probably more realistic, but you could go up to 150, that'd be just fine too, right? But a lot of people will say they like 125 better. I'm cool with that. Okay. Let's end here on a massive summary of the entire video series. I'm going to also make sure you feel comfortable with your recommendations of exactly what to do. So first and foremost, I recommend that you wake up and as soon as you wake up in the morning, just chug some water, okay? Or close, you know, wake up, check your phone or whatever thing. But point is, get started with your hydration, right? Um, now, I will typically drink a full glass of water. I have this kind of ready by my bed in the morning. I wake up and it's literally the first thing I do. I get down a full glass of fluids. Now, I'm only uh, 165 pounds or so. So if you're 200 pounds, maybe you need two of those things. Uh, scale up and down. Point is, I get hydration going very first thing in the morning uh, before I even get up and use the bathroom or anything like that. First thing that happens. Okay. Number two, eat mostly whole real foods, especially fruits and vegetables, and salt them liberally, right? Don't hesitate to do that. The more you exercise, the more you sweat, the more that I'll salt my food. Number three, prehydrate. So you want to drink at minimum half your body weight, right, in pounds, in ounces a day of just water intake. So we talked about that already. Uh, and adjust the amount based on your context. So like I said, your lifestyle, humidity, genetics, temperature, etc. And then use that what system we talked about to figure that out, right? If you're failing the what system, you're not drinking enough pure water. If you're good, you pass your hydration, you pass your thirst, urine, and uh, weight uh, measures, then you're probably in a pretty good spot for your daily water consumption. If you miss it, then you want to hit somewhere in the neighborhood of four to 600 milliliters of cool water, which is, you know, 16 ounce bottle. It's an Aquafina bottle, a normal or something like that at least two to three hours prior, and then another one to 300 or so milliliters, which is five to 10 ounces about 20 minutes before. I like cool because people tend to drink more when it's cool, but you'll be in a good spot there, okay? Then from there, what we call your perihydration. It's the amount of water or fluids to drink during the workout. We talked about taking your body weight in pounds and dividing that number by 30 and drink that much in ounces every 15 minutes or so. For most of us, this is gonna be somewhere between four to six ounces every 15 minutes. If that's sloshy or feels hard on your stomach, maybe go down a little bit, but try not to go too far because your gut is trainable. So you will get better at that feeling and you'll get better at dumping it out. So if this is your first time being really committed to hydration and you get into it and you're like, oh my gosh, I feel so full of water all the time, my stomach, just give it a few weeks. It will get better, okay? Your stomach will get used to that. It is trainable. Okay, within that though, you wanna drink sweat, which is something like a three, to four to one, right? Somewhere between three and four to one ratio of sodium to potassium, plus about a five to 9% glucose and fructose solution. And remember, the only way to get sodium really is combined with chloride. So I don't have the chloride listed here because you're gonna get it de facto with the sodium, okay? What would that look like? It could be coconut water plus some salt and some honey. I love that combination personally. Um, people tend to like it, it tastes good, and, and they'll just they'll just smash it down. Like you'll see, you'll never see an athlete drink a liter of water faster than that. Or you could do something like an element and add some dextrose to it. Um, you can get things like Vitargo, which is a very nice, fast-acting um, a carbohydrate source. You combine that with some element, and you're probably in a really, really excellent spot. 
Um, you can do other things like Cerolite itself does make a carbohydrate-based product. Um, they have some salt-only ones and some carbohydrate ones. So those are all three options you could consider. And like I said, even within Cerolite, they've got a bunch of different combinations of products formulated specifically for that. I would stay away from the big, big brand general hydration drinking products like Gatorade, etc. cetera. Um, those honestly, not, not to go in the wrong spot here, but those companies are meant to sell millions and millions of things for people to sit around and drink all day. Companies like Cerolite, Element, Drip Drop, Noon, those are specifically made to actually hydrate people. And a lot of the cases like in Cerolite, um, those are made for military folks. Um, so they really have a different goal in mind. And when you're trying to max your hydration, let's go with the companies who are honestly trying to maximize hydration, not the ones that are just selling sugar products to 12 year olds. Okay. From there, assess your sweat content if you can and or at least experiment with the aforementioned sweat. So try different combinations of these things at different concentrations as well until you can find a sweet spot. And then lastly, post hydration, Drink your, take your body weight pre and post, figure out how much you actually lost. And then drink at least 125% of that total amount of the same thing you just drank for your peri workout, okay? If you do all five of these things, I guarantee you, you will crush your hydration game, all right? So hopefully you enjoyed this series. I know it's a long haul. Some of you may have gotten some parts from like, I didn't need to know that. In fact, you may be thinking, why the hell didn't you just make this a five minute video and jump straight to this slide? I don't know, maybe if, if you really want, um, I'll, I'll do that or maybe I'll do that anyways. Uh, but you know, look, the reason I make these videos is to give you answers, but also to teach you physiology and chemistry. And now you know how to count and convert from your ounces to your milligrams and all kinds of stuff. And that'll just make your life even better. All right, so I appreciate, oh, wait a minute. Ho, 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 friends, we are not done. We have one more item we have yet to accomplish. That's right, friends. It is time for our fifth criminally rated under, underrated MC, and that is my main man, R.A. the Rugged Man. All right? Uh, go look up his story. He is legendary. He was, uh, I'd say, like a bit of a savant or a phenom in the early 90s as a kid and had all kinds of crazy stuff happen to him. And a legendary guy. He was around in the early, early ages, but is still just murdering the microphone to this day. In fact, uh, his best work, I think, has happened in the last three or four years, despite him being sort of an underground hip-hop legend. So uh, I don't know anyone really super active in the game that epitomizes the lyricism better. He takes it very serious, different techniques, fast, slow, like a cadence. This is his game. So if you appreciate lyricism, uh, R.A. the Rugged Man is, is quite the person. Uh, I would recommend, this is off the cuff here, if you wanted to start, I would look up his guest. Oh, in fact, oftentimes folk, folks will call his verse on um, Vinny Paz's song, Uncommon Valor, one of the best guest appearances in hip hop history. So start with Uncommon Valor, and then maybe work yourself to definition of a rap flow, which is his sort of way to teach you what rap lyricism should be all about. But nonetheless, now we're done, all right? You can go back to whatever you're doing, and yes, I promise you students, uh, there will be extensive numbers of questions regarding our five most, or five criminally, not necessarily most, but five criminally rated MCs on all of your quizzes and tests. In fact, I'm not sure I'm even asking you anything about hydration. I may just ask you questions about hip hop. All right. Thanks for staying around. I, I really enjoy this stuff. I hope you did too. I don't ask much of you. Uh, if you think this is valuable, share it around. If not, enjoy for your own damn self, you selfish little jerk. All right, I'm going to go play with my kids if you didn't hear a scream in the background. See you later, everyone.